Hello, everybody. This is your five-minute warning. We're going to get started in five minutes. So, you know, grab yourselves a drink, make yourselves comfortable, and uh, when you next see me on stage, we'll be getting started. All right.
Hello, everybody. Oh, wow, that's quite loud, isn't it? Um, and then we'll get fading out of the, oh, there we go. No background noise, it's excellent. Welcome to the uh, 23rd Ignite Liverpool, uh, which is a bit insane. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you all for coming. Um, my name's Adrian, I'll be on stage as little as possible tonight so that you get some interesting people talking to you. Um, if you've not been to an Ignite before, um, basically it's a whole series of really short, interesting pre presentations on all sorts of things that people are passionate about. Uh, there are five minutes long, it's 20 slides, each slide shown for 15 seconds, so um, everyone's kind of run on a timetable, there's no overrunning. Uh, it'll all be really interesting and, and fun. Um, and and in, in a break from... Uh, from our traditional thing. We've got a little video to tell you about why you should be uh, giving Ignite Talk. So I'll let that play through, assuming we can get the tech to work. There's always something we try and play around with with the tech. And, uh, and then, um, yeah, Thank you, okay. So I have, I have a confession. Can I tell you guys a secret? Yeah, you, should, you won't tell anyone? Okay, so I think storytelling is everything. It is everything. It's the most important thing that we do. It's the most important thing that we are. And if you go about thinking about life from the perspective of storytelling is everything, then doing things like public speaking or writing or talking or starting a relationship all become a lot simpler. Storytelling happens to be a universal thing. It's a timeless thing. It's something we have done as long as we have been a species. As long as we have been cultures and tribes and governments, we have been storytellers. And in fact, we align ourselves, the people we bond with, we have shared stories that often we tell again and again with each other. So storytelling is something we all do all the time, and we're all good at it. Any community you're in, any club you join, any team you root for, there's a set of stories that you all share. So when it comes to doing an Ignite talk, you guys already have stories, and you're already good at telling them, because that's why you're alive. Now, when it comes to doing a talk like this, doing this format, you have to be a little bit more concise in the kinds of stories that you tell. There's three piles of stories to think about. The first is what you love, what gets you excited. Now, I know for a fact that all of you did not commit suicide today. You're here. Why? What is it that gets you up in the morning? What gets you going? On the other end of the spectrum, there's what you hate. What makes you angry? Hey, what a great start. Um, I'm going to blame Neil, because he always does this to us. Like, we get here on the day and he's just like, oh yeah, I've, got, I've done a thing. There's something in Dropbox. You just need to do that and it'll all be fine. Um, I have no idea why that's not playing any video. Uh, we're going to have a look at it. Maybe we'll play it in the second half. Um, but well, you're missing out on the amazing visuals that I'm sure go with it, he says, not having seen the talk for quite a while. Um, so, yeah, we'll have a play with it in the interval, and maybe we'll do it in the second half. And you get to, you know, it's mostly just to encourage you all to sign up to give a talk next time. So you'll have had, like, an entire first half of awesome talks that will have inspired you and, like, really enthused you. So that will be the main thing that will be driving you to kind of go, yes, I want to give an Ignite talk, at which point you should talk to one of us organizers um, and let us know, and then we can pencil you in for the next one, which is in January. We've got a date for it and everything. We're far too organized, which is throwing me slightly. Um, anyway, let's get on with the actual talks. Um, and our first speaker um, is Steve Flatt, um, who's going to be coming up to talk to us about thinking. So if he can make his way to the stage... Um, I was going to say, there are stairs around the side if that's easier. No, that's all good. <laughs> it's much better if you almost trip over the screen like I did on my way off a minute ago. Okay. Um, How do yeah. you follow that? <laughs> cool. Okay. Are we ready to go? Thinking is an amazing process. We all think. We all think about lots of different things. Everything in this room except ourselves is a product of thinking. We are the most complex organisms in the known universe, and yet we are all conceived by unskilled labour. Each one of us is two organisms in one body, a horse, strong, survival-orientated, threat-minded, and living in the here and now. The horse is interested in staying alive, eating, sleeping, and procreating. It doesn't think, it reacts, it has no imagination. Then there is the rider, the thinker, rational, logical, and selfish. It also produces those things that we understand as emotions, when we are distressed or traumatized, we feel out of control because the horse is in control. Our primitive self takes over and tries to avoid any threat. When emotion takes over, thinking tends to stop. 
We need emotions just as much as we need thinking. An emotionless person is a psychopath and they make lousy decisions. The combination of emotion and selfishness as self-awareness is vital and has to be balanced. We have a better tool, language, but language is not a great communication tool either. Language is the tool of thinking. We can make language say whatever we want. We can twist meanings and deny what we said or change our position by using language dishonestly. Einstein once said, you can't solve your problem with the same kind of thinking as that which caused the problem. We need to think outside the box. Our species does not seem to learn from its mistakes, merely makes them bigger and more spectacular. Descartes once said, I think, therefore I am. Was he right? Eric Idle said, I'm pink, therefore I'm spam. Was he right? My dog is an example of not thinking outside the box. I've caught up, thank God for that. Here is another example of a mess that thinking and language gets us into. When you try to fail and succeed, have you failed or succeeded? Who said this thinking lark was easy? No wonder most of us try to avoid philosophy. Do we think better together? Does teamwork work better? Are think tanks work uh, better? Or do they produce groupthink? Does working in a group leave us with the lowest common denominator, that which is acceptable to all? Or does it produce new ideas? Is the lone thinker better than the think tank? There have been many lone thinkers, Einstein, Da Vinci, Galileo, Lovelace, all incredible thinkers who have changed the world. There are other thinkers who have changed the world too, Hitler, Saddam Hussein, Gaddafi, people who did not make the world a better place. Is positive thinking better than negative thinking? How we think determines how we view the world and determines the way we interact with it. The more negative or threat-minded our thinking, the more we avoid the world around us. The more annoyingly positive we are, the more the world avoids us. Money is a concept thought up by Croesus to make the, work, the exchange of goods easier. Now money is a product in its own right, bought and sold. Money is the product of thinking, and most of you will pay for that thinking for the rest of your lives. Some of us will use their thinking for criminal or devious purposes. Thinking has made money more important than people. People all over the world are dying because the rich countries and powerful men think that money and the power it brings is more important than people. What about our sex lives? Boys are supposed to think about sex 100 times a day. Are you girls any different? We use our ability to think in order to plan our activities in relation to our sex lives. We make ourselves interesting and attractive in the hope that those that we desire will notice us. And if we are unsuccessful, we use our thinking to try and analyze why. If we fail in our romantic objectives, we beat ourselves up. We look at the success of others and try to model ourselves on their successes. And if we fail, we rationalize it in some way or maybe take a different path. And if we succeed in the game of love and find ourselves a partner, our opportunities to think are constantly disturbed. Now our thinking turns to mortgages, bills, school trips for the children and the delights of family life. And so in time, our talk, thoughts turn to other subjects. Alcohol. Alcohol suppresses thinking. It increases our sense of threat. It makes us anxious. So we drink more to hide the anxiety. Alcohol is the product of some very clever thinking. It is a way of making contaminated water drinkable. In your pockets or handbags is the result of an incredible thought process. Each time every one of you uses your mobile phone, you are applying the laws of quantum physics. The ability to make us think has made us the most wasteful creature on the planet. We use up more resources than all other creatures put together. We are enjoying luxury that has never been possible before. The consequence of this is that we are sitting on 270 th 70 years of industrial scrap. Our thinking both creates and destroys. It is time to think about how we can use our thinking more positively, more effectively, and not be shackled and blindfolded by the rat race. It is time we thought about the consequences for the generations to come after us and begin to harness this incredible and unique ability for the benefit of us all. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Steve. Um, lots of food for thought there. Um, I'm here all night. Get used to it. Um, so, from lots of things that are in, in, in a cloud, in a thought bubble, um, then to more cloud stuff, um, our next speaker is Karen Lyon, who's going to be talking to us about her analog life and how it went digital. Off. 
I'm going to take you back in time, not to the distant past, but a world very different from today. It's a 10 year journey, an awakening over time where my analog life met the digital world. It's a story of necessity, a quest for technology, and a journey that changed my life forever, but it doesn't stop today. It starts here in 1996, my life BT, before technology. There are five television channels, there's a video recorder, one channel, and Google were my books. But there was what you might call technology in my workplace. And it led inextricably to where we are today. And that's the journey that I want to share with you. Uh, this is a prompt desk. And although there are now buttons, where there are buttons and there are switches, things now today are programmable. But essentially, the skills I learned then are the same skills I use today. It's just the technology has changed. So how did I need to make this change? Everything was very simple when it was on tape and there were levers and there were buttons and things fed into the technology of the time. And it was through this that um, I had my introduction to the first piece of technology, the pencil, and how I used the pencil to make sure things were right, to make sure things were timed properly. And this led on to things that looked much more technological. We had the that tape. And this was an amazing thing because all of a sudden I could tell it when I wanted it to do things. I could press a button and it would sort those things out. And that kind of changed a little bit and we, we moved on to the mini disc and now we're starting to look a little bit more technological, although this was still a technology in the things that happened within my workplace. The next things that came along started to feel a little bit like a round hole and a square peg. And this is where my digital life started to have to come to the fore. And that was because the round peg and the square hole was a thing that you all know today as the USB. Until this point, everything that I used connected to all the bits of technology through phonos, a round peg now a square hole. And I had to get things off of technology, MP3s. And this was not a hole I was familiar with. <laughs> this hole changed my life. I had to take things that were in one medium and move them on to another medium. It would have been very, very easy if CD rewriters had been invented earlier, but if you look at your history, which this isn't a talk about, CD rewriters didn't help people transfer technology. So this was what I was using at this point, and this is what I was happy with. This is what I was familiar with. This is what I was doing call sheets and cue sheets, and my technology understanding was evolving bit by bit. I had a mobile phone. Uh, this is actually my first mobile phone, and this um, evolved from what I um, fondly called the 20 pence piece, which was in my pocket before this time. And there was text messages, but at the time, people really didn't know what they were, didn't even know if it would catch on. And storage, I really didn't think I would ever fill up two discs, let alone have to carry two discs around with me. But there did come a time when I had to start learning. And I actually started learning through just the magazines that were around. I needed to be able to use this technology. And I was just learning as things came up. So I learned about Windows. I learned about computers. I learned about the computer stuff that I needed. And then this thing called Web 2.0 emerged. And at this point, I was reading these magazines. Half of it made sense, half of it didn't. But gradually, as I went back and reread them, things started to make sense. But at this point, technology and my digital life completely flipped. And I was working as a virtual stage manager for Pilot Theatre in Second Life. And I built a building, and all this digital stuff just became the 3D manifestation of what was on the internet. So my question is, tools of your trade or the technology of things, and when did technology for you be identified as what is now the technology of things. We all have a story, and it's that story that I'm really interested in. So I'm at PCM Creative on Twitter, and I'm also trying to start my YouTube channel, so please subscribe to Karen Lyon PCM. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much for that, Karen. Right, now it may seem like the kind of tape and pencils are the most ancient technology and the most ancient thing that we might be talking about tonight, but our next speaker is going to go even further back than that, um, although maybe not with a technology link. I'm not sure. So if you'd like to welcome to the stage Chris Brown, who's going to talk to us about dinosaurs. Hello. It's exciting, isn't it? My name is Christopher Brown, and I'd like to inform you all that dinosaurs are bullshit. Now, many people will think to me that I'm, I'm just making this up, that I don't actually think they are, but there's a little part of me deep inside that looks at a dinosaur and realizes that that is absolute bollocks. I am not a weirdo, though. As much as you may think that when I suggest that, and I'm not suggesting that maybe, um, let's put it this way, let's describe and understand why. So I went to the Natural History Museum a few, a few months ago, and I'll be honest with you, I'd never seen a proper fossilized dinosaur in the flesh before. Now, if you've ever been to the Natural History Museum, you'd realize two, it's, it's famous for two things. One is shit that's dead, and the other thing is loads of kids wearing high-vis jackets with the name of the school on the back, and it was a Friday afternoon, and to be honest with you, it was quite delicate, and there were fucking hundreds of them everywhere. And it, I looked at the dinosaur, and it just felt really uncanny, and it felt odd and off. So what I thought was, I'll go to the internet and have a little think about it and try and work out whether other people have had this experience before. I mean, you know, the internet, there's, there's something for everybody there. There's pornography for a billion different uses. So I thought, well, maybe there's something there and it would it'd make sense to me. No, no, it's just you, Christopher. You're the only person that thinks that dinosaurs are absolute bullshit. And that became a real concern to me. I didn't really understand why, because surely that's, you know, Seeing something that's completely alien to you, like a dinosaur fossil, should be normal. May I just point out to you, though, that I'm not some kind of uh, creationist or some kind of re weird religious kind of thing. Instead, I'm a bit, I'm a lapsed Catholic, which makes me like Millwall. So no one, so the Catholics don't really trust me, and uh, the atheists feel sorry for me. But um, what I did find out was about the Brontosaurus, aka the Thunder Lizard. The thing about the Thunder Lizard is. Which one of those is actually a brontosaurus? You don't know. You haven't got a clue, do you? You just assume that it is. And the reality was, no one thought brontosaurus existed between 1903 and 2015. In fact, you didn't even realize that I misspelled brontosaurus in the last slide. <laughs> Which is interesting. But the reason was that it was Dr. O.C. Marsh, and he, he, found, he was a, an incredible ornithologist, an incre incredible natural historian. And he, found, uh, he create, found lots of dinosaurs, came up with lots of information about that. And um, one of the things what he did was he put the wrong head on a brontosaurus skeleton, and therefore people thought that, that, brontosaur, that brontosaurus weren't real. But now, luckily, brontosaurus are real. It's okay to like brontosauruses again. Thank God for that. Thanks to that really boring Guardian headline, we know that as well. And, um, but what does that actually mean? Not a great deal in terms of where I am, in terms of thinking that all dinosaurs are bullshit. It merely means that somebody 130 years ago made a mistake, which is fair enough. It's 130 years ago. So what I did was kind of think, well, what, why do I feel like that? I feel like that quite a lot because of the T-Rex. The T-Rex is effectively what you give an eight-year-old if you tell to him, create a monster, and he just creates a fuckload of teeth and no arms. And <laughs> I don't think any animal or any monster could be considered a rex if it can't even actually do that or touch its own dick. I think you're completely wrong on that. If you can't masturbate and you're a dinosaur, you're not the king of the fucking jungle. <laughs> and I think the thing about that is the fact that you know, on the internet, people kind of like use that as an excuse. They kind of say, well, okay, that's fair enough then because it must be some kind of conspiracy or something like that. And the internet's full of conspiracy theories. And it's fairly obvious that scientists aren't lying to you. But there is an element that could be true in a sense. And some called the half-life of facts or the half-life of knowledge, which basically means because everything's increasing exponentially in terms of what we know, every, uh, every 50 years, we can, what you would perceive to be true is no longer true. 
Does that therefore mean that dinosaurs are bullshit? Well, if you go online and check and have a look, there's lots of people, lots of different opinions and ideas, including um, flat earthers. Flat earthers, if you go on Twitter and type say, the wonderful phrase, hashtag flat earth, you have infographics like this that suggest the world isn't actually round. But for me personally, if you have a picture of Tinkerbell on your infographic, you're not really a scientist. So obviously that's bullshit, and obviously there's, a, there's no real reason to understand, and uh, fuck's it, I mean, a flat Earth, for God's sake, we've, we've been in space. But um, <laughs> at the same time, I do think there's a reason to question the world around us, and be like the child, and kind of not just accept the world with you. Now, I'm not suggesting that really that dinosaurs are bullshit, but it is a great opportunity to swear a lot. But... <laughs> What I would say is that it's a fantastic opportunity to question the world around you. When someone presents something to you, just have a quick ask whether it's true. Thank you very much. Thanks for that, Chris. Now, if there was a T-Rex outside beating its feet down, we'd probably all be quaking with fear. Um, which, which, which leads me really, really badly, <laughs> and I'm sorry about this, on to the next speaker, who's going to tell us all about being a Quaker, which I think is very different. But, you know, I'll continue the really bad puns um, whilst apologising for them. So if you can welcome to the stage, Lisa Hoyle. Thank you. That's right. <laughs> Thanks. I started. Um, I'm, my name is Lisa Hoyle, I am a Quaker. I'm not really going to talk about Quakers, I'm going to talk about Christianity. Um, and my talk is Christian religion, not as bad as all that. Um, the reason is it's a response to fairly reductive thinking about Christianity. Um, and that's mostly exemplified, I'm talking faster than I did in my practice. Um, and that's mostly exemplified by, obviously, Dawkins. That's not moving and that is, that's a problem for me. <laughs> Sorry. I'll have to look at this. Um, Okay, so why should he care? Why is it important about Christianity? Um, it's obviously a power base, but also for, for many people, Christianity is an inspiration. It's a comfort, it builds resilience, and it builds community. So God willing, this talk will give a view about the contemplative and experiential side of Christianity and about social justice. Caught up now. So, starting in the Dark Ages, uh, so Lake St. Columba established in Iona a, a, a monastery, moved over to Lindisfarne. It was very much a contemplative tradition. It didn't have much structure around it. That didn't suit the Pope, who sent St. Augustine um, over, very reluctantly, turned back in south, south of France and said, did I have to go um, to establish a bishops and a sense of structure in the... British Church. But the contemplative tradition carried on. So in the 17th century, you've got people like George Fox, who's our guy, saying things like that. So it's very much an experiential, non-creedal, and explorative form of Christianity. It's not about accepting what you're told. It's as much about doubt as it is about faith. And it's as so much about prayer and contemplation and meditation as it is about what the Bible says. So if I'm saying that, how do progressive Christians view miracles? Some say they're metaphorical. Some will talk about healing. Some will say they were culturally and historically appropriate and the power of stories is undeniable as I think we might hear in the second half. But are they relevant today? For many Christians, the virgin birth is socially and culturally very important. But actually, the current life, looking at a tree, looking at a leaf, not denying evolution, actually looking at the miracle of us being here with the dinosaurs and that. So, here's a quiz. One of those is not what Jesus said. <laughs> Anybody? Yeah, okay. So... Progressive Christianity is more interested in Jesus' life and Jesus' example as putting forward equality, 
is stepping back as kindness. In the UK, the Progressive Christian Network is, is active, and I work with people who are very active in opposing drone war, drones, in selling arms, and even in the mainstream Church of England is active in searching for greater equality. So why do we have this view of Christianity which is very narrow and reductive? Probably the media? No, it's not. There's plenty of fundamentalism, there's plenty of paternalism, and there's plenty of intolerance. But if we want to limit our horizons, we go for a binary debate, we go for content and not process, and we go for consumerist fame frames of reference which constantly narrow the debate. We go for substitutes that lack rigor. I don't know, they might be excellent dream catcher interpreters, I don't know, but... And the media, in the end, doesn't help. But the media is just doing what the media always does. It polarizes the debate, and it holds people to account at its best. I don't, I don't really have a problem with the media. So why bother? Again, Christianity is important in this country. And it's also about pluralism. It's about having a society that's increasingly ruled by a consumerist philosophy and challenging that in whichever way you can. So my faith is seeking, engaged, reflective, nurturing, enjoyable, and central. Thank you. that Lisa and that brings us to the last talk of the first half um, and I don't know if this is going to be a bit well I'm sure it'll be a really interesting talk um, and I, I yeah I'm not sure what it's going to be about but I can see a school staring at me at the moment which will be staring all at you in a minute um, so if we can welcome to the stage Jules Howard who's going to tell us all about why everyone has to die <laughs> I think <laughs> It's going to be a bit more light-hearted yes. than that. Yes, that's Do you mind if I take this off? Uh, no. Is that right? Hello, guys. Um, this is... Uh, <laughs> it's not as bad as it looks, I promise. It's all uphill from here. Uh, so, yeah, my name's Jules Howard. Uh, it's, I've never been to one of these before. It's great. It's amazing. So, uh, so yeah, he's going to go uphill. Actually, it's, that's a lie. It's going to go downhill when you see this graph. This graph is essentially a graph that tells us that uh, for every year of our life, our chances of dying obviously increase. But it's actually even worse than that. It's called the gompert makeham rule of human mortality. And basically what it says is that um, every eight years, our chances of dying um, doubles. It doubles. So once you get 30, things get bad from 30 onwards, essentially. Um, so I started a kind of a, a, a quest, I suppose. I, I spent the last few years looking at whether this holds across the rest of zoology, whether or not all animals sort of, sort of have to suffer this curse of mortality, this curse of, you know, upward struggle, I suppose. I mean, clearly some animals don't seem to mind a little bit of death. You know, you think of mayflies, you think of dragonflies, you think of damselflies. These are animals that live as larvae for a couple of years, and then, quite happily, they will breed, obviously, until they die. You must have heard of the echinus mouse, some of you. It's a marsupial family of mice. And they literally invest everything in gonads, everything. They rubbish off their immune system, and they, as they're rotting, they're still trying to have sex. So they clearly, no probs for them, a bit of death. But across life's tree, is this a pattern that we see the whole way across? I was like... When I started on this project, I was like, no way. You know, we're all fixed. You live, you die, and that's about it. But actually, that's not the case at all. I was absolutely amazed that you take something like a, a brook trout. You take a brook trout from Europe, and you put it in a, a lake in North America without predators, and they're living, like, you know, within 20 years, twice as long, sometimes three times longer. Their lifespan shifts. This thing, a pearl mussel larvae, it lives in the gills of fish, and it injects a peptide into the fish. It allows the fish to live a year longer. So the little larvae 
can live within its host for a longer period. So it's actually manipulating the lifespan of another animal. Hydra, you know, one of the most common animals in the world, is in puddles and ponds and stuff like that. You know, stem cells have an infinite, you know, capacity for regeneration. And this animal is everywhere. The C. elegans, it's like the fruit fly of worms. All these animals, they're, they're, they're flexible lifespans. You starve this worm, if you would want to starve a worm, it lasts months. Feed it, it breeds, it dies within weeks. So this flexibility, we see it kind of, we see it all the way through nature. I was absolutely gobsmacked. We see it all the way through nature. Birds should be absolutely pulverized by free radicals. They metabolize three times faster than most mammals, and they're still around. They live, you know, some pigeons might live 25, 30 years. Like naked, naked mole rats are, you know, they are absurd animals. But they can live absurdly long. You know, an animal like that might live 30 years. It's completely riddled with free radical damage. Its cells are aging, and it still lives on. And it doesn't get cancer. There is a whole host of these strange animals out there that we're only just starting to realize. You must have heard of the immortal jellyfish as well. A jellyfish that is like no other. It produces like little sexual swimmers. They land on the bottom, and they reverse back into larval form. <laughs> it's just bizarre. So there was me thinking, Wow, you know, lifespan is fixed. We're all stuck with the ages we're given. Lifespan, that's what you get. But actually, it's not the case at all. There are some pound signs here, because I realized about halfway through the project that I wasn't alone. I was not alone looking at lifespan in animals, like PayPal, uh, Google Ventures, um, Oracle. They are throwing billions of pounds <laughs> Uh, naked mole rats of all animals. You know, they're throwing millions of pounds at this kind of research, trying to monetize aging, I suppose. The, the industry is currently worth 200 billion pounds, I was shocked to learn. A massive industry, but it could be great. I mean, imagine we could move that graph over. Imagine we could reduce the uh, diseases of old age, squeeze them into the last few years of life instead of ruining the NHS like we are now. It's really exciting, but... I kind of got to a point where I'm not sure if it's scary or not, you know, that we're basically allowing people to have the potential to pay to extend their life. I haven't got a pension at the moment. I haven't got a pension. I'm not spending, I'm not working extra to pay for their beautiful retirement that may last another sort of 20, 30 years. And as far as I can kind of see, there isn't this public discussion about this wonderful, massive change in science, and I'm kind of interested in starting that. So thank you for having me. If you want to chat to me, give me a shout. Thank you very much for that. Yeah, see, it did. It was all kind of, you know, up on the up, and a big debate. The debate starts here, you know, Ignite the Liverpool, the, the place where we decided or started to decide whether we want to die or not, or something. Um, <clears throat> but he knows much more about it than I do, obviously. Uh, so this brings us to the end of the first half. We're going to have a kind of 15, 20-minute break where you can get, get yourself a drink at the bar, um, have a chat to your neighbour about what you thought was interesting in the first half, think about what Ignite talk you'd give and, uh, and let us know so we can pencil you in for the next Ignite. Um, we'll also, at the start of the second half, we'll be doing our traditional one-minute pitches. So if you've got a project or an event that you want to sort of get up on stage and tell this kind of wonderful audience about for one minute, then uh, come and find me during the interval and let me know, and I can jot your name down as well. Uh, so, yeah, basically, get yourselves a drink, enjoy the interval, and we'll be back soon. Please welcome Scott Birkin. Thank you. Okay.
Hello. This is your five-minute warning. Going to be get started again in uh, in five minutes, or maybe less, maybe a little bit more. Depends how good my timekeeping is. Um, so yeah, get yourselves a drink, make yourselves comfortable. Starting again in a minute or two.
Hello again, everybody. Let's get the second half started. So if you're giving a one-minute pitch, if you can make it down to the front, that would be good. Um, just so we can get through, you know, through the one-minute pitch as quickly as possible and get on with the rest of it. It's all good. So we've got a few one-minute pitches to talk about. So I guess first up, because he's uh, down at the front already and eager to talk about it, uh, Dr. Tom is going to give us an update on uh, fundraising. Uh, hello. Um, for those of you who weren't here last time, uh, last time I did a uh, fundraiser for the Liverpool Women's Hospital because our daughter Rosalind was born in March and born 10 weeks early. And they did an absolutely fantastic job uh, looking after her. So I came on stage and I had to identify 80 flags of the world in, in the five minutes got all of them. Uh, they were helped by being in alphabetical order and leaving the labels on the last slide, but uh, at, uh, um, I still managed it. And um, I had a uh, initial fundraising goal of uh, 500 pounds, but thanks to the generosity of you guys, the total was 827 pounds and 70 pence. So thank you ever so much for that. If you would still like to donate, it is possible if you go to justgiving.com slash skeptic canary, uh, that's skeptic with a K, uh, justgiving.com slash skeptic canary uh, and give whatever you can, that'd be awesome. Uh, I'm also still uh, running uh, Flag for Liverpool, uh, in case you haven't worked out already, flags are my thing, I'm, a, I'm an amateur vexil vexillologist, horrible word to say. So if you'd uh, like to get involved with that, go to flagforliverpool.org. Uh, thanks to the awesome foundation, who I'm sure you're going to hear about. We've got a website, we've got designs, and we're just looking to take it to the next level. So once again, thanks very much for the um, uh, donations, and uh, I'll see you at the end of this half. Bye. Thank you. Right, our next one minute pitch is from Francis, who's going to talk about board games. I feel a bit nervous asking this. Hands up if you like board games. Ah, yes. Okay, this is easier, this one. Hands up if you like cake. <laughs> so, Buttons Bake House, which is a new artisanal cake baker in Liverpool, they're running an event. Um, it's actually at Does Liverpool. Uh, next Thursday, combining board games and cake. Um, <laughs> woo! And these are fun games that have a nice ending and you can play and enjoy. And uh, if you like board games and cake, we'd love it if you came along. It's a new business in Liverpool, a new idea. It's really popular in Canada. There are loads of board games cafes. So we're going to try and start one in Liverpool. But to start with, we're having events not inside a particular venue. So I've got loads of leaflets. If you, I'm really tall. If you see me afterwards, grab a leaflet. Or, even better, if you're interested right now, put your hand up in the air and keep it up, and I'll come around and give you a leaflet while the other speaker's coming on. <laughs> Excellent. Well, hopefully that's not going to be too disruptive for the next one-minute pitch, which is a double, double bill. Uh, Zarino and Mark are going to be talking about Code Club. Yes, so I like uh, cake as well. Mark, do you like cake? I like cake. I'm I like, like cake, and I also like board games, so I will be there. Um, but uh, we're here basically to mention that we are setting up a code club. Uh, hands up if... Oh, no, maybe not hands up, because that's going to get complicated. Um, <laughs> nod if you know what a code club is. Okay, there's some, there's some of you. Basically, the idea is that kids should learn to code. Um, there's, pro there's loads of here, people here who are programmers. Uh, kids learning to code, it's like a transferable skill, it's really useful and it lets them like, think logically and analytically about problems. Um, and it's also really fun because it brings people together and it's, it's cool solving problems. So uh, we're setting up a code club in Liverpool Central Library um, and it will be starting in January of next year. Um, and it will be like a, a Saturday afternoon-y thing. Probably. Yeah, yeah. We haven't even yet decided on when we're actually going to hold it, but um, probably at the weekend. And uh, so if you, any of you have got kids and you want to take them along and give them a new skill and help them make some new friends, uh, we'll be doing that. Yeah, uh, we've got a Twitter as well, which is at Liverpool Co Code Club. Uh, no, it's not. I'm Liverpool lying. Liverpool Code. Liverpool Co Code. Go there, uh, follow us, and there's a URL. You can go to our website and you can sign up 
to the newsletter and we'll tell you when we start and how many classes we'll be having. We're doing it for kids, but we might do it for adults Yeah, as so, well. I mean, lots, so. of, lots of you maybe aren't programmers, and if you fancy learning how to code, um, we're probably going to expand to adults too. So go along to the website, pop your email address in, join our mailing list, and um, we'll let you know when we get things rolling. Uh, yeah, and if you haven't got kids, uh, you've probably got nephews or nieces. <laughs> uh, or you know parents. Either way, Code Club, Central Library. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for that. We've got, still got a huge queue for people to get through. So the next up to what pitch is Nicola, who's going to be talking about Awesome, which you may have heard mentioned in one of the early pitches. I, I don't think anybody here has heard of Awesome Liverpool. So, um, Okay, so I just want to ask you a question. Um, when was the last time you met someone who was turning plants into synthesizers? Can't say the word. <laughs> um, or met somebody who was trying to cast every single living mammal heart out of plasticine? Or you met Liverpool's youngest entrepreneur, and she's 11. Or, I guess we've got a whole list of these. Musicals Shoes, a projector for um, the smaller cinema, and um, contributed to Makefest. So we do every month. There are 10 of us. We're the awesome Liverpool trustees. And every month, we give £50 of our own money. Those of you who can add up will know that makes a £500, no strings attached grant. And all we're really looking for is people who have awesome ideas. Um, I guess the difficult thing is thinking, well, what, what constitutes awesome? Um, so we have a helpful list of checklist things you can think about. So does it solve a problem? Does it bring joy? Is it locally focused? Serena, what's the other one we always like? Does it have a budget? <laughs> That's Serena's question. Does it have a budget? And um, if the answer to all of those things is yes, then you can apply any time. Um, you need to um, just Google um, Awesome Liverpool, which is kind of easy. And there is an online really short form. Um, have I missed anything? No, I don't think so. So, yeah, I, we expect to enjoy your applications next month. Thank you. <laughs> And our next one minute pitch is Eric, who's going to talk about predictive ambulances. Good evening. Very sorry to bore you all with this. Um, a very strange thing happened last week. I do taxi hailing startups, and I was waiting for an ambulance. An ambulance is basically taxis, and the wait times were really variable. So it dawned on me that if we had some way of predicting where people lived or predicting what diseases they might have, which actually now is non-trivial and can be done, we could actually pre-position ambulances where they were. I'm hoping to do a talk on this at the next Ignite Liverpool. I didn't have enough slides this time. The key reason for this is if you understand that can be done, Amazon, for example, has recently patented a logistic system where things that you might want to buy, they put in a vehicle which is orbiting near your house. So if you do choose to buy it, it will just appear within a minute, which is kind of bizarre. If that technology is used for good, it's fantastic. People need to know that these things do exist and can exist because we have the same policies for drone strike programs. So to link it with an earlier talk on mortality, imagine if the hearse turns up about the right time, you're just about to die. That's another abuse, okay? You may laugh, but we need people to know this stuff isn't science fiction, it's actually 10, 15 years into development. So that's why I wanted to say predictive ambulances sounds crazy, it can be abused, just be aware. Thank you very much. And our last one minute pitch is somebody who's already given a one minute pitch, but this is for something different. And I twisted his arm to give this one so that I didn't have to give it. Uh, so forgive me for it. But Francis is going to talk about Code for Liverpool. Codeforliverpool.org. So Code for Liverpool is a, a new group, and you've heard of things like smart cities and open data and lots of like theoretical big projects, but they're just all too amorphous and distant, and people are trying to get 
like big organizations to fund them, and it's just a bit alienating. But there are lots of practical things that could make Liverpool better now, using all the new technologies, using all our smartphones, using 3D printers, using Arduinos, using the web, using all the amazing power that we've all been given in the last 10 years by technology. And we can use that to make Liverpool better. So codeforliverpool.org is a, a new local group trying to do that. They want people to do projects, like make a thing that takes the central library and connects it to your Amazon wish lists and tells you which books you can get for free or do a hardware hack where if you are fed up of not knowing when the bus lanes are open or closed, you like stick up a thing on the lamppost that tells you um, so everyone knows when the, the bus lanes are closed or open. So we want people to hack Liverpool to be better. So if you go to codeforliverpool.org and sign up with your email and there's going to be a, a social event to, to kick it off that, that's being organised. Um, so yeah, uh, go for it. <laughs> Thank you very much for that, Francis. And obviously, if you don't know how to code, you can go to Code Club, learn how to code, and then go to Code It all just ties in. It's perfect. Yes, ideas. And yeah, we want non-coders as well. Um, so like, you know, there's all sorts of stuff, and people need to come up with ideas and useful stuff to do. And yeah, just join, sign up, and, and come along and find out more. It'll all be good. So next, we're going to show how amazing technology is uh, <laughs> by trying to show you the video that we tried to show you at the start of the first half. And we've swapped media player. So all of you Apple people will be most overjoyed to hear that we're now running in QuickTime rather than Windows media player that failed earlier on. So we'll see if it does a better job than... Uh... If this is on Windows. I haven't got VLC installed on that. If I was in Linux, my normal operating system, then yeah, I'd have VLC. And it all would have worked perfectly the first time. Um, anyway, so hopefully when Andy hits go, we'll be able to watch a nice talk about why you should give an Ignite talk. Yeah, you, should, you won't tell anyone? Okay, so I think storytelling is everything. It is everything. It's the most important thing that we do, it's the most important thing that we are. And if you go about thinking about life from the perspective of storytelling is everything, then doing things like public speaking or writing or talking or starting a relationship all become a lot simpler. Storytelling happens to be a universal thing, it's a timeless thing. It's something we have done as long as we have been a species. As long as we have been cultures and tribes and governments, we have been storytellers. And in fact, we align ourselves, the people we bond with, we have shared stories that often we tell again and again with each other. So storytelling is something we all do all the time, and we're all good at it. Any community you're in, any club you join, any team you root for, there's a set of stories that you all share. So when it comes to doing an Ignite talk, you guys already have stories, and you're already good at telling them, because that's why you're alive. Now, when it comes to doing a talk like this, doing this format, you have to be a little bit more concise in the kinds of stories that you tell. There's three piles of stories to think about. The first is what you love, what gets you excited. Now, I know for a fact that all of you did not commit suicide today. You're here. Why? What is it that gets you up in the morning? What gets you going? On the other end of the spectrum, there's what you hate, what makes you angry. What would you remove from the world if you could? Also, a place for passion. You can be passionate about what you hate. Because in fact, if you think enough about what you hate and you flip it over, you probably have something you should be loving more. So trick involved what you, what you love and what you hate. The third pile of stuff is what you're good at. What have you been doing for five years or 10 years and you finally had some kind of insight that you wish someone had told you when you started? That's money, that's so powerful. That's the most important, powerful kind of story you can tell in a crazy format like this. And if you have none of these three things, then your job is a meta story. You need to do things outside of this format that will give you opportunities to tell stories about. And if you fail that, then you get a meta story about the story, how you tried to find a story to tell, but you failed. That's also a story. Now, when it comes to this format, people get freaked out. I've got to tell my story up on stage. It's now this whole dynamic of public speaking. Well, you should know there's lots of famous public speakers that were actually lousy speakers. People like Cicero, Moses, and this guy, Lincoln. They were probably actually not very pleasant to listen to. They had stutters, high-pitched voices. But what they said was interesting. They told stories that they refined, and they made really clear what their points were. So people paid more attention to the ideas and how it's actually said, which is true today. And in fact, in fact, the other thing to be worried about is the time limit. The Gettysburg Address is only about two minutes long to read. You could do two Gettysburg Addresses in one Ignite. 
So you have no worries about how long, yo, I can't fit anything. Yes, you can. You can fit it in. Now, the other fear people have has to do with the fact that the slides move on their own. There's this grim reaper looming overhead at every moment. It's going to come like a Terminator. It's going to knock me into the next thing. People are terrified about this. I happen to think it's kind of funny. I think it's kind of funny in the same way we worry about things that we can't control. You have two choices for things you can't control. You can be paranoid about them, deny them, or you can revel in them. And I think this is a perfect format. You guys know it's coming. It's part of the entertainment that we're all going to expect to have happen, and we can make a joyful experience come from it, right? You guys are going to support me if I screw up this slide, right? You guys are with me? Right. Thank you. All right. So Ignite audiences happen to be some of the best audiences to speak to because you guys are on my side. You might be drunk, and that may help a little bit. But you're on my side, you're gonna back me if I make a mistake. So if you wanna try out public speaking, you're gonna get good, positive audiences in this environment. Now the last thing, this is the more practical portion of my five minutes, how to use time. It's a philosophical question, but a practical question for these five minutes. You only have time to say four or five things. So you wanna be really careful what they are. You can't fit that much more into five minutes. So think about that before you get started. The second thing is you're going to lose your first slide and your last slide due to applause, people throwing things at you, your introduction. You're going to blow those. You're going to, pra you're going to practice and plan for having less time than even the 20 slides that you get. Now the last thing is a little trick here. People get up here and they go into full speed mode. They're talking like auctioneers on crack. and blah, 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 going really You don't have to do that if you don't want to. So look in the upper right hand corner of this slide. In a second you will see a little mark appear, a little cigarette burn mark. I have now put the same image on two consecutive slides. This is legal. It is allowed. You can hack the format as much as you want. A slide is a, a we don't use slides anymore. The whole notion of a slide is kind of ridiculous. So hack it to tell your story. The last thing, if you're working with four or five minutes of time, you can rehearse and practice 10 times in an hour. Now I recommend you do it at least once before you make any slides at all just so you can figure out what your points are and what you want to say. And then as you practice, build the material and backfill it in. So to sum up, all of you have a story to tell and you're good at it. Second, don't worry about the Grim Reaper. You can hack around that. And third, practice is everything. And I hope to see you guys up here next time. Thank you. See, aren't you glad you waited for the video? It's loads better. Those nice pictures and everything. Um, and as we showed, it's all just, you know, you can even not do the audio to begin with if you've been practicing it in the kind of interval and had them muted so that you didn't annoy everybody. Right, anyway, so if you're inspired by that, all the other speakers you've given tonight, which is probably more inspiring, then, and you want to give a talk, go to igniteliverpool.com, and there's details there to how to sign up. Or talk to me, and I'll probably just point you at the website, actually. But, or talk to Neil, who's at the back, who does all the actual hard work in between Ignites. I just stand up on stage once every three months. Um, oh, I see. Is this where you do fancy... Are you doing this specially to try and get it to... Uh, um, Ignite Liverpool 24 is on January the 27th, if I remembered rightly. Is it going to show me? It is. There we go. January 27th for the next one. So, you know, you've got a couple of months to work out what you're going to talk about, get your slides ready. But it, and even if you can't speak then, just sign up and, and we'll you know, schedule in for one of the next ones. We run them every three months or so. Um, so, yes. Anyway, on with tonight's speakers. And our next speaker is uh, Sarah Jones. And she's going to be telling us about uh, women in Formula One. So if you can welcome her up to the stage. And we'll get started with the second half. Sorry, I'm a short ass. Uh, sorry about the language. Uh, so basically, women in motorsport is what I'm talking about today. Will we see a woman enter Formula One specifically in the future and why? I believe we will through uh, a role model and also a clear strategy in the near future. Um, I am going to be talking about preconceptions. Now, I'm sure most people are aware that women aren't supposed, are not supposed to like it. It's a man's sport. Why do you like F1? You should like clothes and shoes. Uh, it's just a phase and you'll grow out of it and women aren't fast enough but I've had these preconceptions myself as a writer I started in 2012 I've got my own blog which is Jones on F1 which has now progressed uh, to writing for an FIA accredited website and I've also had the pleasure of writing um, an interview with ex F1 racing driver David Bravham which is a great experience so basically you know 
there is preconceptions in the sport, but it's nothing compared to what drivers go through. Um, basically, um, when the slide decides to go, um, we will be doing a quiz. Um, basically, does anyone in the audience know the most famous drivers in F1, past or present? Just shout out names. Does anyone know? No. 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 No, 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 and no. So here we go. Most famous women that have been in motorsport in the past. Maria Theresa de Philippus in the 1950s. Leia Lombardi in the 60s and 70s. You've also got, um, what's her name? <laughs> what's her name? Uh, Jesus. Uh, Davinia Galicia. She was with Hesketh in the 70s. You've got Davinia, um, you've got Desire Wilson. She was with Williams in the 80s. And you've also got um, Giovanna Omasi in the 90s. She drove with Brabham and scored half a point. Go, women! Do you know what I mean? And sadly, you've got Maria de Velotta. She passed away in 2013 due to an accident um, on the track. Uh, it's really sad because she was a really, really talented young girl. So women currently racing in motorsport. You've got Simona de Silvestro in Formula E, Danica Patrick in NASCAR, or if Paul's watching, which you will be, NASCAR. Um, and then you've also got, as it goes, uh, come on. You've got Tatiana Cauldron, who's Paul's wife, who is watching. Hi, Paul. And you've got uh, Lavinia Inks, who is the daughter of F1 racing driver Jackie Inks, who's in Le Mans, if I remember rightly. And then you've also got, you've got Alice Powell, who's a very, very important person to one particular young lady who's in the audience tonight, you'll mention in a minute. And you've got Molly Taylor, who's in the Australian Rally Championship. But it leads me on to a special individual who's here tonight with her dad, and I'm really glad she turned up, is Alicia Rowland. She is 10 years old and she's absolutely fantastic, racing in Formula Kart Stars at the moment and is doing really, really well and secured a partnership with a new team this week. Go, Alicia. Really proud of you. So women that are currently in F1 particular, you've got Manisha Catenborn. Don't mention any contracts, because that's not a strong point. Uh, you've got Claire Williams, who's part of the um, Williams racing team. And then you've also got Susie Wolfe, who sadly announced her retirement today, today of all days. Um, you know, sh I, c I can't believe that. And then you've got... Carmen Jorda, who was known in the F1 circles as the Antichrist, uh, basically because she's there for her looks and not for her talent, but that's not the point. So the future of women in motorsport at the moment is really unclear and there's no, there's no strategy and we need to have a strategy and more role models and more women to get into the sport. So in order to achieve that, there's two initiatives at the moment. The first one is on the screen right now, which is Women in Motorsport, which is backed by the governing body, which is the FIA, which Tatiana Cauldron, Alice Powell, Susie Wolfe and Maria Di Velotto was into. And then you've got the second one, which is the Motorsport Association, which Alicia is a part of, um, which focuses on getting more women into the sport, and that's what we need. There's no role models, there's no strategy. You know, Alicia, I believe, you know, she keeps on going. She's more than talented, she's going to do it. So thoughts from fans of motorsport today. As you can see on the screen, many believe that it's more acceptable in the sport than it is at the moment, and it's accepted by all. And I think that's just, one of them will do it, but it's a question of when. And at the moment, if I had to back my money on anybody, it would be, it would be Danica Patrick, and in the near future, it would be Alicia. Thank you very much for your time, and I hope to see you back next time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. And I'm looking forward to when we get Alicia up here at a future Ignite giving the talk of like how I became the first F1 champion, female F1 champion. Uh, right, our next talk um, is from Jamie Roberts, who's going to be telling us how everything is a skill. Everything is a skill. Basically, 
There's, there's a preconception that some things aren't, that you can't just learn to do things. And yeah, it's just not right. Some people are just good at things, bollocks. Some people do have a genetic advantage. God, it is a bit easier for them, but not that much easier. And there you go. It only gives them about a 10 to 30% increase in the speed that they can learn to do things. Uh, there's a graph. Wait a sec. Let's break that down using completely made up arbitrary numbers to illustrate the point. <laughs> this is where a lot of people quit doing things just before that crossover because the people who are naturally good at it get a lot of uh, encouragement. And uh, just working harder, um, working harder than them basically makes you beat them at about six and a half to seven weeks. I'm going to put these online. There's a thing here if you click it. Uh, there's a thing called persistence hunting that he, only humans can do, where we just walk after something till it's dead. That's what we need to do. Neuroplasticity. You might be a bit nervous, Jamie. Don't worry. Big science would make you sound credible. True. Neuroplasticity. <laughs> Again, you can literally learn to do anything. The brain port is a device for blind people where they put the thing on the tongue and there's a camera here and it makes a picture on the tongue and they can learn to see through the tongue. But you've got to be fair to yourself. Sucking at something is the start. Jake the dog, very wise. So some common myths. I'm not a good, not a maths person. I'm not good at maths. Bollocks. Bollocks that somebody told you. Yeah. This guy said that. <laughs> Achieving anything takes a whole bunch of time. There's that 10,000 hours thing there. 80 20 principle says 2,000 hours will get you quite good at something. Everyone gets stuck at things. If it happens in the middle of your PhD, no one cares because you're supposed to get stuck then. You're doing something hard. But if it happens when you're in school, you're a bit screwed. The whole system of education isn't set up that way. Ooh, going fast. The idea basically caught on because it's sticky and it's easy for people. That some people were good at maths and some people weren't, and it's not true. They did a whole bunch of research about streaming people, bringing, breaking them out into sets, doing all the stuff that probably happened to most of you when you were in school, it turned out that it was just stupid because when they did this uh, Khan Academy thing and they let the students guide themselves, uh, everybody caught up within six weeks for any given topic. So yeah, that's that. Moving on swiftly, because I will. The game, if you've ever read it, or if you haven't, read it. It's a book about how to manipulate women into having sex with you. Or... <laughs> The best business book I've ever read. <laughs> there you go. Um, I'll just let you look at that, because the next slide is the important one. Ignoring the weird sex stuff, the guy goes and meets these pickup artists who teach undersexed, overpaid men how not to get turned down by women in bars. Uh, I'm a nerd, and that's social engineering, and that's interesting to me. So the teachers all have different contradictory methods. They go out each night, approach groups of people on their own, forced to do it. There's some weird psychology stuff that's actually true and very, very interesting if you read the book. But the point is, whoa, whoa that they go out, and they do the same thing again and again and again, and they pra that's basically called practice, and that means that's a skill. Um, a transferable skill, because 
approaching groups of people and integrating them with them is something that is useful in a lot of situations. Talk amongst yourselves. I'm sure you can come up with one. Thank you very much for that, Jamie. Um, and it is just persistence, basically just keep getting up. You should have seen what I was like at the first Ignite. Um, actually, don't, but well, you can find out. It's on YouTube somewhere, isn't it? Um, as all the talks are. Right, our next talk is from uh, Alison Little. And she's going to tell us about what it's like being an artist. Oh. <laughs> Jason Liverpool, I'm just going to go through a few things I've worked on. This was uh, the start of it, 2008 Capital Culture, Superland Bananas. This was the um, BT to show that the city was wireless. So this was the second one I worked on, Land Banana Leaves for um, Brock Carmichael in Old Hall Street. This was, this was a printed vinyl, and um, the smaller one was to actually go in the offices. That was then bought by um, the Peacock in Seal Street. So I transformed it into a Peacock. It originally had a headdress, but that was ripped off, basically. It's still there today, um, but it needs a bit of work. Then I moved on to, that's Anfield Children's Centre, where we did a workshop with the, the nursery and the school club. And we looked at the Short Start Umbrella of what services, so it was family, um, children and um, then two years later we got the go penguin parade this was for manchester velodrome based on chris hoy basically so there's the red cheeks that was when they were in display in st george's hall and um, then um a few years after that i was down in cheltenham doing a similar thing for um the horse parade so obviously it's famous for the races that was painted in a shopping arcade um, so basically we have the front of the horse. This is more recent, done in Kirby for the town centre regeneration. So the idea of the Viking to match the Viking ship. Then we had the writing in Nordic. Then after I did the first mural, they asked me to do a second. So there was the child and the mother. So we basically brought through the idea of the medallion, the Viking, uh, similar, similar features to the father. And it all went down really well, actually. This is, didn't get commissioned, but it was put in for, we're getting snowflakes all over the city for Christmas. And behind that, that was actually Scylla Black in her 66th album, where she was covered in daffodils. But there was only 12 being done, which are done now. This was um, four years ago. I had the old paint shop in Rapid. So it was turned into Rags Boutique which was newspaper dresses, and it was a big exhibition, and children. Similar to this was last year at Aintree Race Course. So we made, um, the business awards were sponsored by Jaguar. So we made business attire from old car tires. So the one at the front is, of course, it's style waistcoat. Um, some are just gone, Man Makefest in Manchester. Um, all the kids, kids' masks made from reclaimed plastic bags, so they were all ironed together. Then we cut the, the different shapes. This is craft practice, a little remix and more. So I'm usually at quite a lot of the craft fairs and I'm in selling from Arts Hub in Lark Lane quite frequently. Uh, other craft work I do, they're all crochet pieces. That's the higher, more expensive end. So this was, the main exhibition was Animals in the City which was a solo at Arts Hub upstairs um, January last year. This piece went to Leicester. Um, if anybody's seen the Great British Pottery last night, there was another Gale exhibit in there, and she actually went off last night first. So that, ooh, sorry. This is Biopolo B, who was done for 
um, World Mental Health Day last year, 2014. She was at the Williamson and Birkenhead. Um, second piece was actually this year's Mental Health Day. Um, that was basically a big skull shape. The leaves are to show vitality. And that was at Uni 51 in the Baltic Triangle last month. Um, this is a concept piece, but it was actually commissioned in Derby, and it's about disability hate crime. So the commission, um, the exhibition was last month, and it was basically a wheelchair and the figure, and it was all polythene stuffed with paper and all statements about disability. Um, this is a piece that's been put in for in Scarborough Prison, where it's an exhibition about basically captivity. So we're not sure if it's going but the proposal's gone in and it's a similar thing again and just how the um the more conceptual work leads into workshops so this is work done with the women's refuge in nosley so it's a similar thing slogans and images to match Thanks for that, Alison. Um, there's a bit of like a school theme been running through the things tonight, hasn't it? Uh, must be because it was Day of the Dead sometime around now. It's as if we, we haven't planned these things at all. Um, <laughs> but anyway, this sadly brings us to the last talk for tonight. Uh, but where would an Ignite be without a talk about flags? <laughs> <laughs> and so if you're welcome back to the stage, Dr. Tom is going to talk to us about uh, flags, I think. Indeed. Okay, right, so the title of this talk is Flags of Love and Hate, because flags can really convey emotions, and uh, flags, vexillology, has, a, has, has very much a dark side as well as a positive side. So um, the first guy I want to talk about is this guy, this horrible, horrible man, Dylan Roof, the guy behind the Charleston Church massacre, killed nine people. Um, but you can read a lot uh, into him based on the flags he chooses to adorn himself with. So on the right, he's carrying a Confederate flag. And on the left, he was wearing patches with the old flag of South Africa and the old flag of Rhodesia, which is now Zimbabwe. And both of these countries, you have a country that's gone from white minority rule to black majority rule. But what about the Confederate flag? Of course, people who defend it will say, oh, it's about heritage, not hate. And the story behind it is absolutely uh, ridiculous and filled with incompetence, and it's very much worth telling. And you can judge for yourself. So the American Civil War, um, a brief part of history of this, uh, was between the North and the South. Basically, the North wanted to abolish slavery, the South wanted to keep it. So, uh, obviously, the, the North, the Union, uh, has the Stars and Stripes, but the South needed a flag. And the first one they went with was uh, the Bonnie Blue flag. It's a weird story in itself. It was a flag of the Republic of West Florida, which existed for 90 days before the US came in and took it over. And it was recognized throughout the US as a flag of rebellion, but it was blue, and blue's a Yankee color, and that's no good. So the first one they went with was, uh, was this one, the stars and bars. So, you know, keeping the colors, keeping the same theme. But this caused confusion in battle, because think about it, you're in a battle situation. Um, you're, you're, there's rifles going off everywhere. Um, your leg's gone missing. Your best friend's face has fallen off. You're confused. You want to know where you turn to, which is your side. So do you go to the red and white striped flag with white stars and a blue background at the top left, or the red and white striped flag with white stars and a, on a blue background at the top left? So. Uh, but to, to solve this problem, they looked at the battle flag of the Army of Northern Virginia. This is what we would call a Confederate flag, except it's square. Now, that's a much better design, uh, so they stuck it on this. They stuck it on a white field, because as the designer said, as a people, we are fighting to maintain the heaven-ordained supremacy of the white man over the inferior or colored race. A white flag would thus be emblematic of our cause. Heritage, not hate, remember? This is a white flag for white people. You could not get any more racist, but it caused even more issues on the battlefield because they're going into battle with a flag that's mostly white. That's not going to cause any problems. So they stuck a red bar on it. Fortunately, that only lasted a month before the war ended. So you'd think that Confederacy defeated consigned history. It's still around today. You've got Georgia and uh, Mississippi have uh, blatant Confederate flags. 
uh, Arkansas and Tennessee and a couple of others as well. Uh, but one flag that's definitely around today and is absolutely horrible is the flag of ISIS. And this confused a lot of vexillologists when it was first revealed uh, because people thought uh, ISIS, it, uh, it looks like that because they're Luddites. Uh, they uh, despise uh, calligraphy and colors and uh, circles. Oh, I've lost one of my images. What's going on there? Um, but, but you actually have a, de a deluxe version of the ISIS flag, which looks very, very similar to the flag of Saudi Arabia, because the writing on them is the same. It's the Shahada, it's the Islamic Declaration of Faith, which makes protesting against, against it rather difficult, for example, burning it. So what this guy did at London Pride was uh, he made uh, what's called the ISIS dildo flag, where all the lettering is replaced by sex toys. Um, so, 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 so now we're into much more positive stuff. Now we're into pride. And the original pride flag is down there on the bottom left. Originally eight colours, including hot pink. But uh, for, uh, for function reasons, hot pink, very expensive. So they produce a seven-stripe version and then a six-stripe version, which is the one we have today. And there's loads and loads of variations for all the different sexualities and genders and whatever. Uh, my favourite is the transgender flag because um, there's a bit of politics involved here because uh, the top one, uh, blue and pink, seen as too binarist. So the bottom one came in, which is more of a gradient. Um, there's also fetishist fa flags. You've got um, leather, BDSM at the top left, which of course is black and blue. Uh, you've got the rubber community, which has got a nice kink in it because they're kinky. And you've got the bear brother. Uh, I'm not going to tell you what bears are. You'll have to look that up yourself. Um, but um, uh, a friend of mine, um, uh, speaking of um, uh, ISIS flags, uh, he read about the Ashes Bakery case. And he called up his local bakery and said, excuse me, could you make me a flag? Uh, could you make me a cake of the ISIS dildo flag and put a couple of Confederate flags on the side? And they made it for him. How wonderful is that? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, Tom. Um, and sadly, that brings us to the end of tonight's Ignite. Um, but if you're all wanting to, you know, give a talk and join in with the fun and get on stage and talk about what you're passionate about, then uh, definitely let us know. Um, bar's still open. You can stay around and chat to people about what you've learned tonight or, you know, debate which one's the best talk or the worst talk. The best talks can be really hard to pick out. There's so many of them. Um, so mostly, it just remains to, to thank... The, uh, the organizers, Andy, Mandy, Lydia, uh, Dan, who's not here tonight because he's a bit ill, which is why we haven't had any sound, in like, the cool sound trip. Um, uh -huh. Ends of each talk, we usually get a nice little sound clip of music, uh, which Dan puts together. Um, and Neil, who does all the hard work between the two, you know, between the events, Neil's one answering all the emails, sending all the tweets, uh, doing all the work to make it possible. Um, so... Who are the sponsors, Neil? <laughs> and we have some sponsors, and they've been shown on the screen, which hopefully is all they wanted. Um, and, <laughs> and if Andy can pull them up quickly enough, then uh, the next one is going to be on January the... Good, good, you've all been paying attention, and I expect to see you all back here on January the 27th. Uh, and once we get through to the slides to say who we're thanking... Oh, there we go. So Mandy has already mentioned Paul, Chris, uh, Emma, Dominique, Mark, Pauline, Coxie. There we go. So thanks to all of them for helping make Ignite happen. And and thanks to all of you for coming along and putting up with me, making a real hash of being on stage. So, uh, yeah, until, until next January, um, enjoy yourselves, and we shall see you soon. Thank you. Yeah.